I hope everybody can hear me. Um, otherwise, just shout or move this way. <laughs> Uh, so I will talk, talk about how to build and maintain Drupal distributions. Um, even if you don't have a distribution, I think most of you don't, but it will still be interesting, I hope so. Alright, so this is me, um, Jan. Uh, I like this shirt, I see. Um, yeah, I work with Drupal since 2009, so uh, started with Drupal 6, um, not use it anymore, of course. Uh, did lots of Drupal 7 projects, so I was working as a head of development in our agency, so I was involved in the architecture of most of those projects, so I've seen it all. I uh, developed big parts of the open social distribution, uh, which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, now I'm a VP of product at Open Social by Coca-Cola, so I am responsible for the, um, the roadmaps of the product. Uh, there are three icons. One is a server, the other is supposed to be a mountain bike, and the other is a uh, racing bike. So these are my hobbies. Um, yeah, my presentation is aimed at developers um, who are interested in maintaining multiple sites, preferably with a distribution, but just open social, or like a Drupal core could be fine as well. Uh, it might give you some uh, inspiration to automate more yourself. Um, there will be some code in here, so if you are afraid of code, uh, yeah, you can still go away. Um, or leave after the about our product flavors, because that's pretty basic. So I will tell, tell a little bit about Open Social. We prepared a small product video as well. And then I will tell about how we deal with distribution, SaaS basic, uh, premium, and enterprise. Um, and then the infrastructure of how we build this hosting, uh, how we do releases, and the challenge of maintaining multiple websites. Uh, because there are some challenges, and I will do a small recap and um, a list of future improvements if there's still time left. Okay, open social. So um, maybe some of you already saw the presentation of my colleague about open social. Um, but yeah, it is a project founded by Coquerella in, um, yeah, what was it, 2016, the beginning of 2016. We started it after we did, uh, yeah, we did a really cool project, Greenpeace, uh, Green Eye by Greenpeace International, and it's a community of their volunteers all over the world, and we got a lot of requests afterwards, and we were like, hey, we can maybe, um, yeah, make this more optimized, this process, and just create a distribution. Um, we are 17 persons big. We are in Enschede, the east of Holland, and also in Amsterdam, in a TQ, which is a startup hub um, founded by the next step. Uh, open social, yeah, that's an out-of-the-box solution for online communities. Uh, it works really well for external communities, where you maybe want to talk with your clients, for example, for product communities, uh, but also for knowledge sharing communities within organizations, for example, or ideation, brainstorming about new ideas at organizing events and groups around uh, certain certain topics. Uh, the software is used by hundreds of organizations, big and small, and um, yeah, of course, we don't know all of them because the software is open source. Open source. Um, I don't know how to do this exactly, <laughs> but I have a short product video. Uh, it's on 4G, so let's hope it loads. There's supposed to be some sound, but I can also talk you guys through it. So this is what you can do. So you can create events. Uh, you can log in a uh, private message to, uh, yeah, to contact people directly. Yeah, you can create groups to, 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 to get members together, basically. Yeah, you can create events and they have a start date or an end date and you can place them in groups or uh, outside of groups and you can also enroll to these events. Uh, so it's a perfect way to connect members both online and offline. And this is a tool, the community analytics tool we built for site managers. 
so they can see if their community is still successful. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, it's a button in a YouTube video, which probably doesn't do anything, but you can create a website yourself on our, on our website. Um, one of the projects we did is Global DevHub for the UN. So this is connecting multiple uh, development uh, professionals uh, all over the world to, to discuss certain topics. It has more than 50,000 members and it was, not, it was one of the first projects we did uh, launched in the beginning of 2017. Yeah, they have a nice quote here. So uh, it was a crucial moment for them and they were really happy uh, with our software. And within a few days, they already see a lot of engagement, um, which was a great success, I guess. Uh, another project we did is Pachamama Alliance. This is a, a volunteering organization, uh, I think in San Francisco. Uh, yeah, they bring people together to work together on a sustainable future for us all, uh, which can mean for yeah, basically everything, of course, but it's mostly uh, environmental. Um, they have a worldwide community, so we needed to make this multi-language, Spanish and English. Uh, sorry, and this is a quote from them, so um, they were really happy with the flexibility of the software. Uh, so the, he's a developer himself, and uh, yeah, he said that 20% uh, of the development uh, only needed to be done because the rest of it was uh, was already there. So that's really good to see. Um, yeah, I will talk, talk talk to you more about the flavors of Open Social. So we have the distribution, which some of you might have seen already. Everyone can download this for free, use it for free, extend uh, uh, where needed. Uh, the second one is our SaaS version, so this is out of the box, open social, suitable for smaller communities or community, communities who do not, do not require uh, customizations. Uh, the third one is the enterprise version, uh, yeah, that is mostly customized, so uh, mostly look and feel uh, or extra modules or integrations with APIs, CRMs, etc. Yeah, so to dive into it a bit more, this is uh, the Drupal.org project page. Um, yeah, so we are one of the most popular, I think the, the most popular full feature dri the Drupal 8 distribution. Um, yeah, we have more than 1100 installations currently, and it is built and maintained by the open social core team, but yeah, of course, with help from the community, so there's a lot of, uh, yeah, um, uh, it, it, like comments in the issue queue and uh, book reports, but also uh, features w which are built by the community. So that's really cool to see. Yeah, this is the second flavor. So um, this is just the distribution and a few extra modules and configuration. Uh, you can get it for 200 euros uh, if you are a smaller community or if you are a little bit bigger. You pay 500 euros a month. It is fully managed, so we take care of the updates and the hosting for you. Uh, we do some support as well for this, so um, yeah, whenever you have questions, you can contact us, and also community consultancy. So we help uh, these communities to uh, to interact with their uh, their community. So we help the community managers basically, and it's the same code base for everyone. So this is uh, yeah quite straightforward from a technical point of view. Yeah, this is the third flavor, so that's the most um, flexible one. Uh, hosting, it's kind of the same as SaaS, uh, basic and premium, uh, except that, uh, yeah, hosting can be on premise as well. So this, uh, this is uh, interesting for some bigger enterprise clients and customizations are possible. So you can have a different team and design and also other modules and integrations. Okay. So let's dive into the technical details now. I think up to now you guys understand a little bit about the structure we have and uh, the, the, what we offer. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, so about the infrastructure. So this is what it looks like when you are a potential client. So you can just log into our website. You can create uh, a new open social site yourself. So it can be created by anyone, basically. You can select SaaS Premium uh, to pay per year or, or, or per month. Um, you can also select basic, of course, which is not on this page. Uh, yeah, and then you just fill in the site name you want and the site subdomain and uh, where you want to host it. You click on create new site 
Uh, you wait 10 minutes and then you receive this email that your website is ready. So that's super cool, right? Um, but of course, yeah, that's just what the client can see. So there's more behind that. Uh, we have to make it happen, right? We are developers. Yeah, and we have a few requirements uh, for this whole infrastructure in mind. So we, we want it to be easy for site managers to create a new website. We want to keep the cost low. That's also important for us. Uh, we want hosting to be anywhere in the world, uh, especially now with the GDPR. It is uh, very actual as well. If people want to host in Europe, they should be able to do this. Uh, yeah, and we have developers. We don't have hosting experts within the company, so we want to focus on uh, building new features, not on setting up completely like difficult uh, infrastructures. And yeah, we also want to have the ability to grow within the same infrastructure. So if somebody wants to grow from premium to enterprise, that's also a possibility. Um, yeah, so we really found a good fit in the platform that is Um We already used them, so it was kind of also stick stick to what you know. Um, everything is Git based and really developer friendly. So you can just open a new pull request. It will create a test environment for you uh, within a few minutes, and then um, yeah, you can check this environment. If everything looks looks good, you can just merge it, and uh, then deployment will go automatically as well. And also they provide hosting options anywhere in the world. So you can just host it in Europe or USA. Uh, that's no problem on Amazon or even on a Sufrain hosting in, uh, in Germany. Uh, they also have a really nice API because yeah, we want to have everything automated. This is also important for us. So you can just create this API to create and manage your projects. Uh, you can just use this API to create and manage projects there. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, and hosting is scalable, so you can add extra services, what you need, like Redis, Solar, etc. Yeah, this is kind of what the SaaS architecture looks like. So, um, yeah, on the top left you see Agos, which is kind of the front end. This is where the uh, potential client creates a new website. And this will send a request to Primate, which is a simple, a simple uh, Symfony application. Um, yeah, and, and Primate connects with platform.sh, so this uses the platform API to create a new website. Uh, and then you have uh, a platform.sh who, uh, who connects with some Ansible scripts, which is a Shipster's uh, app you see there. And um, yeah, that, that's kind of it. So it looks it looks complicated, but I will talk talk uh, talk you through this uh, in the coming uh, minutes. Yeah, this is what the code looks like. I hope you guys can see it also on the back. But um, yeah, this is the uh, I think the method from the platform that is H API. So you can just create a new subscription. There's only one required uh, parameter, which is region, and you can just create a new new project basically with this uh, just calling this method. Um, yeah, and then we need to make sure that. Um, uh, the platform that is H server can reach our repository. So we have a few private repositories. What we do is we uh, add the deploy keys to Bitbucket like this. So we use the Bitbucket uh, API for that. And that's just one simple comment to add all the uh, deploy keys to all our repositories. Yeah, and after that is done, we just initialize the Git repository. So you just tell um, platform that is H use this code base as a, uh, as a basis for the new uh, new project. And after that is done, we can just uh, do a good old uh, Drus site install, which takes, I think, what is that, five minutes. Yeah, and then it's a, uh, we need to add the domain. This is a two-step process, so we first add the DNS entry to our domain uh, name servers. And then uh, we add the uh, domain to the project in platform.sh. So it's, uh, it's basically only one method you call. Yeah, and then we need to get a login link to the website. and. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of it. it it's really that easy. Uh, so everything is automated at this point. Um, yeah, we only need like a few lines of code, and also the big advantage is that it is PHP. So we are all familiar with this, and um, every developer can work on this, the junior, medium, or senior. And yeah, the clients get a new website within 10 minutes. Yeah, so we were really happy with this, but yeah, of course, then you are not there yet. You still have to do releases, and when there's a new Drupal, Drupal core security update, you have to to do a new update. Or when we uh, release a new feature, clients also want this, right? So uh, we also made some uh, yeah some steps there. 
So we have made it simple by using Ansible playbooks. Uh, Ansible, not sure if everyone is familiar with it, but it's an automation slash uh, orchestration tool which allows you to put uh, to put repeatable tasks in a, I think it's called a playbook. Uh, yeah, and it's very easy uh, easy to use and easy to extend as well. Um, yeah, it's really cool uh, because of the platform .h architecture that everything is Git based. So we just have one base SaaS repository where we do the development, and we just push this repository to all the the SaaS sites basically, and that's it. Yeah, and it will also automatically trigger new deployment. Yeah, and then we have Primate, the Symfony sites, uh, which provide the inventory of all the websites. So we can use this uh, this inventory in our Ansible scripts. And this is just a list of project IDs, SSH URLs, and uh, Git repository URLs. Yeah, this is what an Ansible playbook uh, looks like. So, yeah, it's really easy to create repeatable tasks. In our case, it is super simple. We just have two steps, which is create a snapshot, because things can go wrong, and then uh, do a Git push. Um, yeah, and then there's also some extra steps to inform us on Slack. Yeah, and uh, each project has a platform app YAML, so uh, this makes sure that the correct steps are done automatically on the deployment. So what you see here is some cache clears, uh, update uh, the bay, and uh, feature revert. Oh, don't ask me why. Yeah, and this is what it looks like in our SaaS integration channel in Slack. So here you can see that all of the deployments were successful. And this goes in the, uh, uh, per 10. So we basically do 10 sites, and then we do another 10 sites, and another 10 sites, etc. Yeah, so to conclude for SaaS Basic, it's not that hard. We can automate everything. We did automate everything, and all the code bases are the same. So uh, this is fairly easy. Um, yeah, and it's very close to the distribution, so only some permissions are changed. So testing is also is also fairly easy because we test everything with two developers uh, for the distribution. Yeah, and we can rely almost fully on just the automated test. Yeah, and most importantly, the effort uh, it took us was relatively low, so it took us a few hundred hours uh, to build all of this. Uh, because we used existing tools and infrastructure, uh, we don't have to maintain our own infrastructure, which is also important. Um, and we can use the same logic for future tasks, so for creating backups, for example, or creating a central locking and monitoring system. Or maybe automating uh, security updates of contract modules in the future. Yeah, and then we have enterprise sites. So these are we are heavily customized, so there are some more challenges here. Um, the main problem here is that each site has their own code base and their own modules, uh, look and feel, and sometimes they name things differently. So sometimes a group is called a network, while the functionality is kind of the same behind it. And yeah, this especially impacts automated uh, testing. So uh, well, e when we have a test, for example, a user X created a group, and he expects uh, the message group was created successfully, yeah, that the test doesn't work anymore because we use the word network for, for group. Uh, so this, that's just an example uh, of what you uh, encounter. Yeah, and a different team is handling the maintenance of that. So um, basically, when we release a new distro version, uh, they encounter the issues, and it might be a little bit uh, too late. And there are usually a few versions behind, so there's a lot of time uh, yeah, between we, the core team, making a new release and the other team uh, doing the updates. Yeah, so what we figured is this could be a nice solution. We need to test uh, quickly, so we need to automatically test distro updates in enterprise projects. We want to have instant feedback, um, because yeah, that's really important if you we want to fix issues when you are still in contact, so everybody still knows what, what it's about, and uh, that will save a lot of time, because uh, then you can, you can fix issues before they basically arise. Uh, also, you can collaborate more, so uh, when the distro or the core team encounters an issue, we can just walk to the, uh, to the enterprise team and say, hey, what, uh, what might be the cause of this, and uh, do you guys have a solution here? 
And also we hope that in the future updates for customers uh, take less time because we, uh, we fix it earlier. And any of the customization for the enterprise projects are then also done already. So this is kind of the idea we want to work on. Uh, what it looks like is kind of this. It's a bit technical maybe, but we do the um, uh, development on GitHub. So when a new pull request is created, it will send uh, a message to the webhook on Primate. And then Primate will trigger a build for each of our enterprise projects, uh, what you can see in step three. Uh, and then uh, Jenkins takes care of pushing the code with the updated version to a test branch, um, the, which is on Bitbucket. And Bitbucket automatically synchronizes with our platform that is age environment. So this will trigger a build. And it will, in the same time, trigger a build to Shippable as well, uh, which will send uh, back the test result to Primate. And Primate uh, will send it back to the to the pull request. So this is uh, kind of the idea. Uh, and yeah, this is what it will look like on a pull request. So we already have Travis test for all our uh, BHAT and uh, simple test, uh, a PHP unit, sorry. Um, and in addition, now we will add MOS, and Project MOS will show the end result of all our enterprise projects here directly in the pull request. So we know that when we build a new feature or fix a bug, uh, we know if it will, uh, will give any issues on our enterprise project. Yeah, and if the build is clean, we can just merge the pull request, and then uh, Primate will be notified as well, and it will trigger a cleanup via Jenkins, uh, which will... Um, We'll check if the PR is merged or maybe closed. And if it is merged, it will merge any of the non-auto commits uh, to, to a new fixed distro branch. And if it is not merged, it will just delete, uh, delete the branch. Yeah, so it's kind of the same as in, uh, in, 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 in the last slide. But uh, what you see here is that uh, it will check out fixed distro 8.x, 1.x, which is our, uh, our release branch, our future release branch. It will cherry pick non-auto commits from the uh, from that branch in the enterprise project. So it could be that you have to make uh, changes to the enterprise project to make the new feature work, and that will it will then push that uh, to the fixed distro 8.x, 1.x branch uh, in the enterprise project, and then it will delete uh, the old test uh, test branch. Yeah, and the biggest advantage now is that you have a branch with the latest Nile version ready for the enterprise project. Uh, so the quality will hopefully great, greatly improve because you, yeah, you already have uh, have only code which is not failing on the enterprise project. So everything is automated tested, um, and any manual testing can still be done on that branch. Uh, periodically. So, for example, we can do this once every two weeks. And in the future, um, we can even improve it now more by, uh, by, by improving the flexibility. So, especially the naming of things, which is a challenge for our automated test. If we have a solution for that, that will, will help a lot. Because then we can just uh, further rely on the automated test. And it will also help for the community, uh, for the quality of our distribution, because yeah, we will improve our code for flexibility, so it will um, will support more uh, more use cases. All right, so uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, almost there. I want to summarize it a little bit, and then there's some time for questions, if there are any. Um, yeah, so to recap, the infrastructure we have for SaaS Basic was built very quickly. Uh, it opens a lot of extra possibilities, so that's super cool, I think. Yeah, we need to work on optimizing the update flow for enterprise projects. Uh, this is um, our main focus for the for the coming months. And Project Moss, uh, what you saw, is a nice first step for providing feedback about enterprise projects in the distro pull request. Yeah, in the future, uh, we want to work on configuration management. Uh, maybe you already saw the. Uh, the presentation from Christian from Thunder. Um, the, the, there are some nice things going on there, so we want to learn how other distributions are doing this. Maybe we can combine some efforts there. Um, and we also want to look into the new CMI2 initiative, which was announced uh, at the latest Drupalcon. And uh, yeah, we want to improve the automated test that 
uh, automated tests further by supporting string overrides and maybe visual regression testing. Uh, and when we open the trials again, we should maybe consider using custom Amazon servers. This is um, uh, this is only for to, to bring down further the cost, um, and it should only be used for non-paying sites, in my opinion. Yeah, maybe there are some questions. Uh, I have more like business-oriented question because whenever I heard uh, custom-based code uh, or, or custom uh, cu customer fork of solution, it uh, every time frightening me uh, because I was working with financial product and uh, whenever something comes from the app, in this case I'm, I'm meaning uh, some regulations. I had to uh, push changes to all our clients and in case if one of the clients is stopping paying for the product, we mm -hmm. are stopping releasing updates to him, but then we are forced uh, to release updates, latest example GDPR, and uh, that particular client is so different from uh, when, uh, uh, different from the other clients because when he stopped paying for his updates, uh, his code base stopped, was free, uh, ne never uh, developed, and then after a couple months, years, we need to release update to that client. And uh, if you're gathering clients, more and more and more clients, uh, this will be more time consuming for you as uh, as a developer. How how are you dealing with that? Um, I wish we had a lot of clients. <laughs> um, now we have some clients, but. Um, Basically, when they don't pay anymore, we cannot provide support. So this is this is SaaS. So it's software as a service, and uh, you can pay by month. And yeah, if you don't pay, we we have to end the subscription. So we just put aside a maintenance mode, basically, and we provide a HTML um, a maintenance page. I'm not sure if this answers your question. Uh, not completely, because as uh, you, you said, she is stopping paying. She is ha she has no product. Uh, but uh, what in case when he has product located at his site, not uh, exactly at the SAS, uh, he has fork uh, his code to his own server. Yes, so that kind of depends. So if it is if he is just using the distribution and we don't know about him, or maybe we help them with some uh, yeah some uh, some consultancy, then it's basically their problem, right? They probably have a team who, who works on this, and we can advise them to to make updates for GDPR, for example, or to implement this security update. That's basically all we can do. And if they are hosting on-premise, and if, if we build a website for them, and if we do the maintenance for them, yeah, then yeah, we have to work together and solve, solve this. Um, I'm glad we haven't encountered uh, anything like that yet. Uh, you showed us uh, on one slide uh, workflow uh, with uh, two um, repository providers. Uh, GitHub and Bitbucket. Why uh, two providers? Is it only about economy because uh, private uh, repositories are cheaper on Bitbucket? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> it is kind of like this. So we use uh, GitHub for our open source development um, and we use Bitbucket for all our priv private repositories and that's the only reason. And I think now with Microsoft acquiring GitHub, uh, it might still be a good, uh, good thing. <laughs> I have one more question as well about use platform SH and then, for example, do you tie the, how do you, cause you have to pl pay for platform SH as well and for example, how do you tie the fact that somebody pays you for a year, do you then pay platform SH for a year and versus if someone pays you for a month and you pay platform SH for a month to actually just make sure that if platform is eight changes pricing in half a year, you're kind of safe. How do you manage that? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, the advantage of platform.sh is that you pay for basically the minute or the hour. <laughs> so so you pay for what you use. So if a client leaves, then um, we usually give them one week. So we say, hey, you don't pay anymore. We will delete your site within one week. Are you sure? And then uh, we pay for this extra week. So yeah, uh, but that's just to to. To, yeah, it's just like a little bit of uh, uh, security for our own uh, sake. Um, but yeah, then we just delete it. So and you only pay for what you use. So yeah, uh, that's pretty pretty good, I think, in my opinion. Uh, that's not a technical question, uh, but uh, well, 
you have a uh, number of a lot of uh, clients, and uh, you have the same code base for all of them. Yeah, and uh, well, normally like each client has its own like perks and like uh, requests, and uh, well, we develop some new features. So how you how you develop this? What how, how do you, like treat requests from different clients, and uh, how do you manage to like have the same code base for everyone? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, we first of all we are very open in our communication. So we say here's a roadmap. This is what we will build. And people can submit requests. So if people have ideas for new features, they can submit submit this. Everybody can see these ideas. Every other client can vote on it, basically. So we are really open on what we what we want to to build in our SaaS basic uh, product. And yeah, if they um, if it takes too long for them, or if they say, hey, uh, uh, this is not we really need this feature, basically, then we say, yeah, you can also go to enterprise. And then you pay 2,000 euros a month and not uh, 500, you know. Uh, and that, that's kind of how we deal with this. And in addition, we try to make our, our uh, features very configurable. So you can just enable it or disable it. And uh, yeah, when multiple clients ask for the same feature, we put it in our SaaS basic product, but we, we make sure there's a toggle to turn it on or off. So some sites can enable it and some sites can uh, disable it. So you mean yeah, the enterprise clients have a sort of a priority in uh, like uh, serving their uh, requests and uh no, I don't think priority is the right word, but they have more flexibility because they have their own code base. Uh, they, 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 uh, so enterprise clients have their own code base. Uh, if try your payment gateway, yes. Okay, uh, according to your diagram, only the front end interacted with Stripe. How did you solve it that, that the back end doesn't receive any, any information about payment? The front end, what you saw in the picture, is yeah, a the Drupal 8, 8 site. There are only two hours from the front end to Stripe and yeah. back. So Stripe doesn't interact with the back end anyway. Correct. Um, but so, so what we do is when whenever let, like uh, there's a site cancelled, this is done in the front end. So w when the site is cancelled, it will just send a request to Stripe like, hey, this site, uh, you don't have to pay for the subscription anymore. And that's basically the only kind of interaction we are doing with Stripe. It's only to create a new subscription or to cancel an existing subscription. Okay, isn't it easy to hack somehow if, if only the front end interacts with Stripe? So uh, cannot the user somehow send, send a request to, to the back end directly that, that it's paid? Um, yeah, um, but it's all out, so we have an API, and uh, that's uh, it uses all out for uh, uh, identification. So yeah, you know we can be hacked. Yes, <laughs> if that's your question, and uh, then you probably don't have to pay for it. That might be a risk, but we don't have that many clients. We we basically know uh, which one are there and which one are paying. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks. So yeah, if you make this sound so easy, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I know it's it's. Quite complicated on some uh, some levels. So, um, would you recommend doing similar setups for different Drupal projects or distributions? Or and and if so, what are the biggest problems to solve still? Like, w what should people watch out for? Mm, yeah. So I can recommend using this setup uh, if you want. Uh, if you want to have, uh, uh, if you don't have much time or if you don't have hosting experts, I think this is really great. Um, and yeah, you can basically use it for every distribution. Um, what to watch out? Yeah, I think also like the advantage that we have is that we have this front end which creates this new site and, um, and that, that's what kind of makes it complex, right? So if you only have a distribution and you talk to your clients before you create a website, uh, and you create a website as a developer for them, you can you can basically skip the whole Primate uh, and Argos and uh, Stripe thing, right? So um, then you can just use the scripts and the Ansible scripts to update the sites and you can use platform API directly. Uh, so that, that would simplify it a little bit. So uh, it kind of depends on the use case, I guess, but I can imagine that for some distribution or for some companies that might be better to just skip the whole uh, primate, Symphony, uh, Argos, Stripe thing. 
Okay, thank you. When you're working with uh, Platform SH and all of those other services that you integrated with, did you find that what you wanted to do was merely provided by their services and there needed to be modifications? What kind of modifications? So, for instance, like, did you need to do any pull requests or suggest certain features be added to any of your integrations? Mm, yeah, so it, at first we noticed that the API of platform was not uh, really mature. Uh, so in the beginning we had some contact with their team and, uh, uh, we, we, yeah, you know, so we had, we had to ask a lot of questions like, hey, what happens now? You, we suddenly created 100 subscriptions <laughs> and, uh, do we have to pay for this, you know? Uh, um, so yeah, we had some of those difficulties, but now I think uh, especially the last uh, nine months have been really uh, smooth. Again, more like business oriented <laughs> question. Uh, my off uh, was when uh, message board uh, PHBBB was in their pike, mm -hmm. then uh, MySpace died, our uh, local uh, social network Nasha Klasa died also. <laughs> Everyone moved to Facebook. Uh, what is the trend in the uh, in the background of latest uh, Facebook uh, leaks event? There, is there a uh, trend to to move to to custom social network like previous PHPBB message board or something like that? Yeah, I wouldn't use that one. Um, no, yeah. So, so so this is hard to uh, to to like predict. But our prediction is that this will happen in the coming years, that you get more like a focused local communities and people create their own community, host their own community, own their own data and uh, not everybody can just join this community. Uh, so this is actually um, what, what we kind of predict, but you never know what direction it will go to. Not everybody deleted their Facebook uh, last month, I guess. So uh, yeah, we don't know. And we are not like a direct competitor of Facebook anyways, right? I mean, uh, they have a lot more budget, they have a little bit different use case. Yes, but I'm uh, asking about, have you observed uh, such a trend to move uh, to, to, to external? There's a more interest uh, in uh, such local communities, because, for example, uh, in earlier years, everyone want, wants to have their own message board yeah. for their own community. doesn't matter if it was fandom, uh, interesting hobbies, or mm -hmm. etc. Everyone must have own message board. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, we noticed kind of a, like a, a change. We uh, so, for example, when uh, we had like a really famous uh, program in Holland, and this guy said on TV, "You should all delete your Facebook on Wednesday evening." You know, and what we did is we uh, like uh, in Holland, like ten years ago, you also had a really famous social network. It was called Hives. And it was really big in Holland. Everybody was on it, basically. So what we did, we created hives.catopensocial.com as kind of a joke. <laughs> and um, yeah, within I think two weeks, we had uh, 15,000 uh, members. Uh, so that's quite a lot. And uh, we just did it as a joke. But I think this was kind of a reaction to this whole uh, like privacy and uh, data legislation thing. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the, the community is slowly like uh, dying a little bit, you know, it's not that uh, that active anymore. At one point we had like every minute a post, but now it is maybe every 10 minutes, you know. So yeah, it's really hard to predict where we will end up, but yeah, I could see, you can see a little bit of change, but uh, yeah, I hope that it will go more towards the local communities, but yeah, we just cannot know this up front, I guess. Okay, well, thank you guys.